I think that uh, this year's COP was trying to concentrate on uh, measures to mitigate uh, climate change problems, so bring down the, uh, the rise in temperature. We should not forget, so it all started um, in 2015 with the Paris Agreement, and it was agreed that each year there would be a conference in which uh, countries would report on progress made and would also commit themselves to further new measures. So it's in this continuum of COPs and, and meetings that we have to understand what was discussed. So uh, <clears throat> what was very high on the agenda is to try to, to bring down the rise in temperature uh, by the, the end of this century to below 2 degrees centigrade. So that's like a figure, that's like a, an objective, a goal that is easy to grasp. But of course, the way to get there is quite difficult. So that's why there is like different kinds of, of pledges in different kinds of uh, thematic fields, energy, transport, uh, things like that. Well, I mean, um, we just had uh, this prize uh, in which apparently we were selected amongst some others to be uh, highly, I would say, uh, climate uh, efficient or, or respective, uh, we respect, sorry, uh, the, some, a number of issues. So as we speak here, this is uh, triple glazed, the windows. So we have a uh, heat pump, we collect our rainwater. So I th I, we try to be as energy neutral as possible and we try to be as renewable as possible. We try not to uh, spill too much uh, energy uh, where not needed. But when we have to, to, to heat the, the premises or to cool them, then we try to do that in an energy efficient way. And in a way, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> things here in the building that prevent us from wasting too much. But of course, there's always some energy lost here and there. But so I think that with the given state of, of technical affairs, I would say, we are doing quite well. At least we did our best. So. Uh, presumably, <clears throat> in 10 years' time, there will be new techniques, and so we may again uh, have to improve on a number of issues. But I think that at this instance, as we speak, we are really uh, top-notch as a kind of uh, working environment, and so we were uh, honored for that. Personally, I would always think that you have to be uh, uh, very, or you have to have a good sense of self-criticism. And I think that you have to, to analyze your own behavior. Um, I think that you can uh, cut waste for food or whatever. Uh, by, by analyzing your behavior, maybe when you go out to eat, not to order too much uh, and, and eat what is on your plate, and not to throw away that food. Uh, but it's also about uh, yeah, how you deal with energy use. I mean, uh, uh, I'm sitting here. Um, I don't think that this, this room is heated now because I didn't put it on anyway. So, but uh, I'm, I'm quite comfortable uh, and I don't need high temperature in my room. Uh, I'm living here in Cole A. I haven't put on uh, the heating there. Uh, and I must say, I, I, I feel rather warm, but I think then it's from <laughs> the warmth that is produced uh, by the other apartments. So I think that if everyone analyzes his and her um, behavior, then we may already uh, come closer to, at least in our own life, uh, solving partly what we can do, the problem of climate change. But more than that, I mean, we are a fair trade uh, faculty, uh, students should maybe buy more fair trade products where they have the choice, maybe refrain from eating, and I know in Czech Republic maybe that's not easy to say, but eating uh, always each day uh, animal products. Yeah, I mean, uh, to, to review a bit uh, the way in which we live, in which we eat, in which we do things, and also like not uh, uh, go for a, a private car. We, we have now car sharing here in the university. So make use of those uh, opportunities that are uh, offered. So it's about 
self-reflectance. It's a bit about being self critic yeah to criticize one's own behavior and try to improve on that so if you want to uh, improve the world then you have to start with yourself if you want to solve problems you have to start with your own behavior and what would be your vision for the future um, is there a possibility to even like improve what we are actually doing right now as a faculty or even the students if they are if you think like yourself there could be um, some sort of improvement uh, like in a manner of years, not like in decades. But yeah. Well, I maybe can uh, tell you about the experience in Ghent. The um, sustainability office in Ghent got a lot of its uh, inspiration from what the students were telling them. In the way that uh, the students uh, were analyzing um, like uh, energy consumption in the different buildings. They were doing the measurements, uh, you, it, like a kind of uh, assignment, a group assignment. And then the, they shared their conclusions with overall university management. And it was only after the students had started this process of critically looking at things and analyzing things that management started to, to shift in their thinking. So. You, you can argue that this is still maybe a slow process, but not if you are continuously bringing in new elements and new ideas. So I think that students can have their role. Uh, there is uh, associations of students, uh, they organize beer events and blah, blah, but you can also work on content. Yeah? And I think that uh, in a way, university faculty management uh, is sensitive to that kind of, uh, of, of message. I think that because we, we, we cater for students, yeah, we cater also for problems of society, but uh, we are in constant uh, dialogue, I would say, with students. So students can also raise problems, but should also uh, bring in ideas on how to, to provide solutions. Maybe we have blind spots. Uh, maybe because you are every day here uh, in, an, in another setting, in a classroom or this and there, you see things that we don't notice. So bring them up in a friendly way, and then we will react in a friendly way, in a positive way. And I think we need that. Each and everyone working here, personnel, student, visitors, should highlight possible problems and, and, and see together with us how to, to find solutions. So yeah, I think that students can have uh, their say and can bring in these solutions. And this can be sometimes on very uh, quick and, and concrete uh, things. Well, the atmosphere was not that uh, positive in the way that people in the conference were not that positively impressed nor enthusiastic about what uh, had been discussed and more so uh, decided. I think that like with most of these uh, gatherings, um, there is a lot of um, pledges made by uh, governments, by presidents, by official instances, and they pledge. And then you would expect them also to commit themselves after the pledge and, and to do what they had been pledging and promising. Now, in the specific domain of uh, deforestation, in the beginning, people thought, wow, great, uh, 2030 is only nine years away. So then uh, deforestation will have ended by then, but it became quickly uh, known that uh, Bolsonaro, for one, Brazil, he would step up deforestation now and then maybe, hopefully, stop in 2030. But so more trees would be felt now until then than before. So uh, apparently it's very difficult to, um, to have these governments do what they promise. Just now I also heard that Malaysia is uh, using other definitions for uh, deforestation uh, than Indonesia. And why do I mention this? Well, Indonesia is the bad guy because they cut down forests uh, for oil palm. Uh, Malaysia normally has been able to impress uh, the international community with its policy of uh, respecting forests and, and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, they cut as much. But it's for other purposes. It's maybe more for timber production. But the thing is, those two countries, they have the same language, they have the same culture. They are very close to one another. But 
Malaysia sets itself off against uh, Indonesia, they have the good image. Now, if you start uh, looking closely, more closely, then you will see that, as I said, uh, Malaysia is like doing a bit similar than Indonesia, as Indonesia. So, um, what I think is, is failing, what is uh, not there, is an, an international body that would control and monitor the pledges and the commitments and see uh, what uh, is done in effect, what is concretely done. Now, and everyone can pledge, you can pledge, I can pledge, and no one will come to check whether I did what I promised. So that, I think, is maybe something that now starts taking some firmer ground. And hopefully, there will be a body that will have this power. So it would be like a UN for climate change kind of organization like that, but that has the power to control monitor and intervene and correct. Yeah. This is what is uh, missing now, I would say. Now, uh, you asked about the deforestation. I think that um, the same feeling had with uh, coal. Yeah. So uh, there's lots of governments uh, that said, OK, we will uh, stop coal mining. But then if you look, the, the big baddies in the world are China and India. And they were blocking the signing of any agreement and they had that they wanted to have a rewording just a few verbs yeah a few words um, of the uh, eventual agreement that they wanted to sign and it was to have to allow them to continue uh, to mine coal because a lot of their energy uh, depends on coal and then if you look closer australia is dependent on coal um, Germany depends on brown coal, so it's a kind of peat. And, and a lot of their energy mix comes from that. And they will not back down immediately because the, the transition, the shift, would be too quick, according to them. Czech Republic also depends. Poland depends on coal. However, they all have promised that they would cut down or even stop. But even that will not happen from today to tomorrow. Take another thing like transport, um, air. Uh, I think the 10 biggest uh, companies in the world have uh, promised that they would uh, fly green by, I don't know what date. But here again, um, it's very difficult to see now how they will do that. I have flown in a, a cleaner airplane of KLMs uh, in the beginning of this year. But still, of course, it uses uh, kerosene, it's, it uses the, the old energy mixes. So um, it will take a much, much time before they will be able to shift to really green airplanes. So it's other measures that uh, you need in the transport field to be taken. I mean, you have to rethink the way we move. Do, uh, does every one of us need a car? Uh, I myself have basically, apart from just a few years, never owned a car because I'm not interested. And I'm pretty happy with public transport. Now, of course, if I have to fly in from Belgium or if I have to come in from Belgium to Prague, if I would take a train now, it would almost take me 20 hours. And then I have to change twice, also in the middle of the night. That's not a, a friendly way of, of doing things. But uh, as long as governments do not invest themselves or subsidize or push private companies to shift away from air, air transport that is super cheap into something that is also rather fast. I can live by a night train going, and there will normally be something like that next year going from Ghent to Prague in 10 hours time without me having to change um, trains and it would be a night train so I can sleep on the train. That's fine by me. But so you, what, governments have to step up their efforts to offer those kinds of solutions. So I think that uh, for each of the promises, there was uh, some critical debate questioning whether it was feasible, whether they would indeed transite quickly into that new situation.
yes, yes, yes. Well, not this time, but I was also in the previous COP, which was in Madrid. Uh, of course, that was the, the beginning of her uh, famous era, I would say. She had just uh, had a year of uh, her strikes uh, against uh, the, uh, the climate change uh, uh, problem. Um, and so she was very much uh, in the news. Also now, uh, everyone has maybe seen the, her arrival. In, in England and how there was hundreds of uh, journalists around her and so she's very tiny <laughs> so if she is really surrounded by lots of uh, adult people you hardly see her so uh, she makes a very shy and friendly uh, impression and I think uh, she's a she's a good example of course I mean she's committed she commits a lot of time I don't know whether uh, here in Czech Republic you have your own Greta we have a few in uh, Belgium who also go along with those, but of course, uh, not having the world renomé that uh, Greta has. But yeah, Greta is a nice little figure. And maybe, yeah, for students, uh, it's, it's, it's good, like we are a fair trade uh, faculty, um, that uh, we should keep up, the students should keep up the momentum and, and also the pressure on um, politicians, on, on policy makers uh, to, to, to keep them informed to, to have them face the reality and because um, if <clears throat> it, it goes at the pace it is going now we will be, be very slow in reaching whatever goal and promise so um, I think um, normally I'm rather an optimistic uh, person but in the case here of climate change and the problems and how to solve them I'm rather pessimistic um, the trouble is, it's not like a sudden death kind of thing. Yeah? Now we have uh, another volcano that is uh, active uh, in, in Java, and so people die. Then all of a sudden everyone is trying to find a solution. But with climate change, it's uh, very insipid. It, you, you don't feel it. Yeah. Okay, the temperature has risen with 0.1 centigrade over the last three or four years. So what? As long as you don't live in Vanuatu, you don't notice. Yeah, so that's that's the trouble. People only react when there is sudden pain, sudden death. Uh, that's what COVID does. I mean, ah, lots of people die. Ah, we have to find a solution. So we develop a vaccine, and very quickly. Now we would have like a similar attitude and reaction for climate change. We should find uh, a vaccine that works very quickly. <laughs> well, yeah, in a way, I think uh, it's now uh, for the second year in a row that um, our uh, initial plans and ideas and all that were uh, a bit uh, jeopardized by the, the COVID, uh, I would say, sometimes even the scare and the paranoia around it. I think that um, at the end of the day, okay, uh, if we uh, follow a few of the, the guidelines, uh, keep our distances and all that, that um, we will, first of all, learn how to live with the COVID. Um, probably and hopefully uh, its in incidence and uh, negative impact will uh, lower over the years. And so in, in the meantime, I hope that in 2022, to start with, we will be able to resume much better than what we were able to do over the last two years, what we had in mind, uh, like resume our activities as we had them before. So in this respect, I, I must say that I'm quite hopeful. I mean, uh, you have to be. Um, it's a moral choice almost um, or an obligation. But I also think that uh, if uh, the faculty, the, the academics, the professors and the students can work together on a number of issues, like we were discussing, uh, addressing uh, climate change problems, but also biodiversity problems. Uh, we have planted a tree. We have a very nice campus. It's full of interesting birds, uh, especially in spring. I think uh, I invite all students to take a good look. I have some ideas of maybe organizing some nature tours here because the premises are really very interesting. So, uh, I, I mean, we have an interesting setting, we have an interesting uh, student community. And so I think that all together we will be able to beat the COVID and to go and progress further in what may be a better world, hopefully in a few years time. <laughs>